You know, I know who Margaret Sanger is, and uh, I know that she believed in eugenics and that she was uh, not particularly enamored with black people. And, and one of the reasons that you find most of their uh, clinics in black neighborhoods is uh, so that you can find a way to control that population. And I, th I think people should go back and read about Margaret Sanger, who founded this place, a woman who Hillary Clinton, by the way, says that she admires. Look and see what uh, many people in Nazi Germany thought about her. In 1916, H.G. Wells' lover, Margaret Sanger, starts her promotion of eugenics in the United States. In 1923, Sanger receives massive funding from the Rockefeller family. Sanger wrote to fellow eugenicist Clarence J. Gamble that black leaders would need to be recruited to act as front men in sterilization programs directed against black communities. In 1924, Hitler pins Mein Kampf or My Struggle and credits U.S. eugenicist as his inspiration. I admire Margaret Sanger enormously, her courage, her tenacity, her vision. I am really in awe of her. By 1927, eugenics hit the mainstream. The so-called science was aggressively pushed through contests at schools, churches, and at state fairs. Churches competed in contests with big cash prizes to see who could best implement eugenics into their sermons. Major denominations then tell Americans that Jesus is for eugenics. That same year in the United States, more than 25 states passed forced sterilization laws and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of brutal sterilization policies. When Hitler came to power in 1933, one of his first acts was to pass national eugenics laws modeled after laws in the United States. The Nazi brand of eugenics had embarrassed the elites, but they had no intention of stopping their plans. The Allies literally fought with each other over who would get top Nazi eugenicist. It didn't matter if the SS doctors had tortured tens of thousands to death, they were free to go. The angel of death, Joseph Mengele, and his boss, Otmar von Verscher, were not prosecuted, and von Verscher even continued his work in Germany after the war. Eugenicists were angry that their great work had been exposed. They then scrambled to camouflage their agenda. Eugenics Quarterly became social biology, the American Birth Control League became Planned Parenthood. New terms like transhumanism, population control, sustainability, conservation, and environmentalism replaced racial hygiene and social Darwinism. Mrs. Margaret Slee, president of America's Planned Parenthood Federation, maintains that European women should stop having babies for the next 10 years. Don't you think such a theory, such a radical theory, is antisocial? On the contrary, it seems to me that it is more practical and humane. What about the women who want babies now and in 10 years will not be able to have babies? Rather impractical, don't you think? Oh, John, you do ask hard questions. I should think that instead of being impractical, it is really very practical and intelligent and humane. High alert in Britain, as the facade of terror attacks similar to the ones orchestrated in Boston supposedly threaten the lives of the royal court. Scotland Yard's Royal Protection Branch and the Home Office have been informed of the plot that includes the Queen and also reportedly includes Prince Charles and possibly the British Prime Minister David Cameron. The attack will supposedly occur at an event next weekend to commemorate the anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Locations allegedly targeted include the St. Martin's in the Field Church, the Field Marshal Slim statue, and Westminster Abbey. The unsubstantiated threat will result in increased security for the event. Veterans have been told they must provide photographic identification to obtain tickets, according to the Daily Mail, something they've never been asked of before.
But is this just another mass PSYOP? Another rollout by the global military-industrial complex to prepare the public for future orchestrated attacks? The colluding ties between British intelligence and Islamic extremist leaders reach back before 9-11. In 1996, British intelligence paid Al-Qaeda around $160,000 to fund an assassination plot against Libyan leader Muammar al-Qaddafi. The British press was banned from discussing the case. The New York Times asked, Did the British government try to assassinate Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi, the Libyan leader, in February 1996 by planting a bomb under his motorcade? And did the plan go awry? Because agents from MI6, the Foreign Intelligence Service, put the bomb under the wrong car, killing several Libyan bystanders. Britons may never know the answer. A sweeping injunction has barred newspapers and television news programs from publishing the embarrassing allegations about the inner workings of Britain's security services, brought up by a disgruntled former officer. The media have been forced to discuss the allegations without actually saying what the allegations are. Abu Hamza al-Masri, the imam presiding over the infamous Finsbury Park Mosque, Hamza began working for British intelligence and police in 1997. He informed on fellow Muslims and was granted favors by MI5, including the release of suspected terrorists. Hamza told his aides he was beyond the reach of British law. In 1999, Hamza would be implicated in the kidnapping and murder of Western tourists in Yemen. He would tell police he was following the Quran and would be released. The police returned to Hamza audio tapes packed with usual messages of intolerance and hatred and culminating in exhortations to kill the enemies of Islam. Harun Rashid Aswat, a top aide to Abu Hamza, would later be singled out as the supposed mastermind of the London 7-7 bombings. Aswat is also suspected of working with British intelligence. Omar Bakri Mohammed, who collaborated with Osama bin Laden, also worked for British intelligence. The British government knows who we are, he said. MI5 has interrogated us many times. I think now we have something called public immunity, Bakri admitted in 2001. Like many jihadists, the Syrian-born imam was connected to the Muslim Brotherhood, a documented British and later CIA intelligence asset. The terrorist who trained the London bombers was a U.S. informant. The London Guardian reports citing his exceptional cooperation in working with the U.S. authorities, a New York judge released Mohammed Junaid Babar, despite him pleading guilty to five counts of terrorism. The 10th of December of last year, six years after his initial arrest and subsequent guilty plea, he was sentenced to time served and charged $500 by the court in a special assessment fee. Other leaders of Islamic extremism protected by the British government in what is now being dubbed Londonistan include Al-Libi, implicated in the alleged Al-Qaeda bombings of two U.S. embassies in Africa. Abu Qatada, the radical imam, told MI5 agents he exercised powerful spiritual influence over the Algerian community in London. The cleric sermons were found in a flat in the German city of Hamburg used by some of those involved in 9-11. In May, the British government fast-tracked a proposal to allow police to monitor the conversations of alleged terrorists. We will introduce legislation to combat groups and individuals who reject our values and promote messages of hate, said Home Secretary Theresa May. Since 2000, the government has introduced five major pieces of terrorism legislation, often in response to anticipated events like the supposed plot against the Queen. A theater of fear has persisted worldwide, with all of the roles inhabited by government patsies time and time again. In order to pass illegal, liberty-destroying legislation, how is this latest threat any different? In the words of Thomas Jefferson, when government fears the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. John Bound for InfoWars.com.